All right, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, roll call, please. Morris? Here. Larson? Here. Smith? Here. Perkins? Here. McAdams? Here. Verbeck? Here. Favor? Here. Mayor Barnes? Here. Eight present. Excellent. All right, let's go ahead and do the Pledge of Allegiance. Chief Bird, would you mind leading us in the pledge? Thanks, Chief. All right, agenda item C, approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Alderman Smith, seconded by Alderman Favor. Roll call. Morris? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Burbick? Yes. Favor? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. Eight aye. Awesome. Uh, public participation. I don't have any, Ruth? No, sir. Okay. So no public participation. Um, presentations, agenda item E, that's none. Appointments, agenda item F, that is none. Moving on to agenda item G, consent agenda. Item number one, accounts payable and payroll through October 11, 2021 in the amount of $1,268,382.88. Can I have a motion? So move. Second. Moved by Alderman uh, Perkins, seconded by Alderwoman Morris. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call. Larson? Yes. Yes. Perkins? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. Eight All right, the consent agenda passes. Excellent. Moving on to public hearings, agenda item H, we have none. Then off to agenda item I, considerations. So number one, consideration of a proposal from Sunvest Solar Incorporated to develop a solar farm at the DeKalb Taylor Municipal Airport. Uh, city Manager. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, everybody. Uh, as I mentioned in the background, uh, our city staff have been meeting with Bill French, who's the regional director of project development for SunVest Solar of Geneva, Illinois, about the possibility of developing a solar farm on the northwest side of the DeKalb Taylor Municipal Airport. Mr. French is in the audience tonight, and uh, if you have any more detailed uh, questions about his firm, uh, he'll be here to answer any of those. Uh, the area in question was uh, represented, uh, and it is here in your background. Uh, it's a 48-acre uh, area that uh, is roughly uh, north of the main entrance and uh, west of the ring road that uh, steers traffic away from our north-south runway. It's been in corn uh, since it was acquired by the city of DeKalb, so we got a little bit of farm rent from it. Uh, as I stated in the background, there's, there's a little more detail than I'm going to review, but I'm happy to answer any questions on this. Uh, the uh, uh, city has a relationship with, with Mr. French and his company, as uh, some members of the council will recall. Um, uh, the company has an interest in some property at the corner of Gurler and South First Street, and uh, they have participated in the, the lottery that uh, is um, uh, supervised by the state of Illinois to try to encourage more solar farm development. That lottery, though, is, is not tied to name and experience, it's tied to your number. So like any other lottery uh, that we play, we may consider playing. Uh, so if, if you're lucky, you get a little bit of an opportunity, and if you're not, you don't. Uh, the company has been successful in, in the lottery and other places, but not for this particular site. Uh, so we, we thought, uh, after discussing with the Airport Advisory Board, the possibility of different kinds of development on that site, uh, that it might be worth having a conversation, and the discussion has been fruitful to this point. And I've described in the background some very general business terms that would uh, attend the development of that 48 acres for uh, solar farm purposes. And uh, without reading all of them uh, in your background, uh, we do talk about a 25-year leasehold that would uh, generate uh, an initial uh, lease rate of $1,800 per acre times the 48 acres that first year the lease uh, proceeds would be 86400 Talked about the possibility of an escalator for each year thereafter, 2% was what we had come up with. Uh, that would give us over 25 years, which is the proposed term, uh, about $2.8 million in, in new revenue. The, the airport 
fund does need some new revenue. We've been, that fund has been surviving on fuel sales and uh, rentals for quite a while. Uh, the alternative is to build uh, more hangars, and we do have uh, uh, a waiting list. Uh, uh, as Alderman Favor is aware, he's uh, our council rep on the, on the board, but uh, that requires some upfront devel development costs from the city, most likely, uh, or some participation. It takes a little while to, to get that going, and, and uh, the, the lease returns would not be as great initially or possibly over time. So we feel this is a, a unique and um, a positive opportunity for the city. And I thought I'd bring it to the council so you could kick it around and the public could, could review it. And with your direction, we can proceed uh, or not with this. And we recommend that we do. Questions, council? Alderwoman Morris? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Alderwoman. I, I apologize if I overlooked it. What's the current income from uh, corn? The farm rent? Mm -hmm. uh, less than 10000 Okay. Per? Alderman, per year. Per year. Okay. Alderman Favor? Sure. I, I think this is a great opportunity for the airport. I think it's you know, a good way to raise some revenue. Um, one of the things we did talk about that DeKalb is well positioned in terms of um, what we charge in terms of our rents, what we charge in lease space. Um, there's a lot of land that's around the airport that's on the field as well as off field. So there's a lot of opportunity. Um, I'd like to challenge you to, you know, I guess challenge the board again to look at development opportunities to try and increase the revenue for the airport to make them self-sustaining. I know the, uh, the fuel is a great um, draw, so the last, if, if you don't know, the airport's been shut down for about three, four weeks, um, but there's been a lot, the airport sees a lot of traffic just due to the, uh, the price. We are one of the lowest uh, prices in the area for fuel. I know people fly from all over to DeKalb to refuel, so it does bring in a lot of people. I think with Facebook, Ferrara, I think there's opportunity for potentially corporate hangers. I think we could attract some larger companies from the from the west or from the east out here. So yeah, I'd like to see opportunities for development specifically around the airport. Oh, Alderman Morris. So can I ask Alderman Favor, are you in favor of this option of yes. development? Yep. Actually this was um, if you go back a few years, there was a um, I forget what they call it. It's the, there's, a, there's a project plan that you have to have for airports, and this was one of the uh, land use development opportunities that they had identified uh, several years ago for the airport was to have a solar field. This is dangerous. They, they just gave me the clickers. So. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to do here is to show you this patch of land here. Now, there obviously is an influence zone So that's another possibility too. So just to give you some context, this uh, uh, proposed solar field area does not preclude us from having more hangar development here, as long as it doesn't uh, uh, violate any of the FAA prescriptions for the proximity to uh, taxiways and runways. And then there's also some area to the west. In fact, the far west, there's been conversation uh, that our land abutting peace and uh, the, cor the corner of Peace and Pleasant would be the southeast corner, could be used for some commercial purposes as well. So uh, there, there, I think, I think Alderman Favor is absolutely right. The, there are other development possibilities. The most recent uh, redevelopment that we did is that uh, clean up, fix up of the old hangar on the west end that uh, uh, a uh, helicopter company is now using under ComEd's auspices as a subcontractor. They uh, are in and out with uh, helicopters uh, all day long. They, they have two or three that are 
parked there and, and housed there. But that generates a total of 20, just under 25,000 a year, so it's mm -hmm. small compared to what's proposed here. Alderman Perkins? I'm trying to get a, an idea of the broader landscape then. So is this the fourth solar field I'm thinking that we've DeKalb, DeKalb County has approved recently? And then what's the average size of these? Oh. And how does this compare? Well, this is a five megawatt. Uh, for this particular site, we had entertained the possibility of two, two megawatt. And now I'm tripping into uh, some uh, area that Mr. French is much more familiar with, having developed such farms. But five megawatt, I think, gives us a better bang for, for that particular area. Now, the fields that uh, the, the mega fields that you're thinking about, like the one that had been proposed for south of the Facebook site and then also in the northern part of the county, uh, in the county's jurisdiction, they were looking for special use permits and so forth. Uh, those are much larger. Those are, uh, in some cases, uh, hundreds of acres, you know. Okay. Uh, this is a, a more uh, limited area, but it's uh, one that would... Uh, generate a fair amount of uh, energy for the grid. And uh, again, I'll defer to Mr. French if you have any more particular questions on that. Okay. Alderman Smith? A uh, couple questions. I, Alderman Favor indicated that, had the FAA already looked at this years ago, do you think, Tony? So there is um, part, of the, part of the approval process, and the city manager can talk to this as well, that there will be there will be uh, an inspection of the site and approval that needs to be given before the fine, before the construction begins, permitting. And the next thing I'm going to ask, how about the height restrictions? Are they going to feed to the grid overhead or underground? Um, I, mean, the, it'll, I mean, it's a ground level operation. So. No, I mean the actual feeder lines into, into the... <coughs> underground. Underground. So, uh, thank you, Alderman Favor. The, uh, I, I brushed over, but it's in my background. The, uh, um, the developer is, is, uh, has a, taken on the responsibility, if the council will be agreeable to this, to uh, do the due diligence, which involves uh, certain FAA guidelines for, for glare uh, studies and other things, and which would be of interest, of course, to people in the surrounding area, including other tenants of the, of the uh, airport. Uh, but in this case, the actual... Uh, cellular panels don't create the glare. In the, in the old days, in the earlier versions of this, it was the, the trim around mm -hmm. them, the metallic trim around them. Oh, that's no longer part of the, con the construction, but as I understand it, but it, there still has to be a study, and it's required by the FAA. Now, we, do we own more land around that? Don't, how much, is that all ours, or how much that's is ours? Uh, it's, that's the west point. side of this is, is uh, in the county jurisdiction. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So it was nice to have a little entertainment during that discussion. <laughs> and Alderman Verber. Beyond the 25 years, so then do we see use for this land? Or I guess what I'm getting at is seeing what some farmland is selling for to companies in the area would be, be better off considering sale of this property today if it's allowable, in other words, to maximize our potential for this 48 acres? Uh, I, I can't uh, speak for Mr. French on this, but uh, uh, the lease is what we were looking for uh, at this point. Uh, the, uh, so the price right now is, uh, we, know, we know what the price is on the south side, but farmland is still selling for 30,000 or a little bit less an acre. Certainly that's contributed to the peak, but we're not gonna get the, uh, uh, what was it, 90,000 90, an acre? That was, uh, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, 30,000 uh, times the 45, yeah, that, but that uh, wasn't of interest to the company to purchase the property at this time. Oh, I'm just saying to our interest as opposed oh. to lease, if we don't Down see- Down the line. A, if, Down okay, the I was line. say, if we don't Absolutely. see a future use, yeah. Uh, beyond this, right. uh, related Absolutely. to the airport, then at, at what point would we just say, uh, let's put it on the market? I'll probably not be here to do that. <laughs> 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 I'll work on it. 
Alderman Favor. I was just gonna, I <clears throat> didn't see it in the immediate backup, but I it might have been in the further backup. What's the number of offset number of homes that the five megawatts would? Oh yeah. Um, again, I think Mr. French, you might want to address oh, this. Yes, sir. Yes, please. Give it specifically. I'm with Solar. Um, so typically one megawatt will serve about 200 homes. Mm. That's generally how it works. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Uh, it all depends on usage. You know, everyone uses a little bit of sure. uh, yeah. energy differently, and that's usually kind of the rule of thumb we like to use. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Alderman Morris? So I understand sometimes uh, this energy can be diverted elsewhere, long distance, far away. So where will this energy be used? So this would be put onto the local distribution grid. So we would tap in somewhere on the airport property um, and then serve the, uh, uh, the localized grid here. So it would go to the substation. It's a large substation on the west side of, of Peace Road. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a big one back in there. It actually feeds into there. And then wherever that electricity is sent is where this would go also. It's indiscriminate. I, we're not going to take it to one property or not. Gotcha. It just gets onto the, onto the localized grid. And it's at the distribution level, not the transmission level. So transmission of the great big towers, and yeah, they, they travel from state to state to state. We would just stay here within the ComEd uh, service territory with this one. Any further questions? Mr. French, thank you. Um, so you're looking for head nods, move forward, right, Bill? Yeah, so mm -hmm. we're all good in thank you. continuing this we'll, process? Uh, thank you. Thank you. We'll, thank you. We'll talk to Mr. Thank French. You. We'll come up with an agreement with uh, okay. working with our city attorney, and then we'll be back. Alderman Morse. I, I just want to say I genuinely appreciate this use, this efficient use of uh, the airport's land. Thank you. S really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and to have an additional revenue stream for the airport is, is fantastic. So it just seems like the city continues to get more and more creative on how we can maximize the, the property we have or the revenue streams that we have or the people or the technology. Um, so this is, yeah, this is fantastic. All right, we're going to move on to resolution item number J. Um, as you all know, I own property in the TIP district that this is about with the architectural improvement program. So if it's all right with you all, I'm just going to hand the gavel over to Alderman Favor so he can run this part of the meeting. And I'll step outside and return shortly. Thank you, Alderman Favor. Item J, resolutions number one. Resolution 2021-090, authorizing an architectural improvement program, economic incentive for AccuLab of Illinois at 509 Oak Street in the amount of $25,000, former Camelot Building. City Manager. Oh, and can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Second. So moved by Alderman. Tracy and seconded by Alderman, Alderwoman Morris. He's that one it was, it was, yeah. it was that. Oh, Larson? Yeah. Sorry. Seconded by Alderman, Alderwoman Larson. City manager. Thank you. Uh, let me just first paint a, a fiscal picture here. Uh, with the closing of TIF 1, which we've talked about a little bit here, and we'll be having, having more conversation about during our, our budget review. In another month or so, uh, TIF three then becomes the remaining TIF. It's a smaller TIF, uh, a fractional size and area, land area, and also in terms of the increment it will produce over its life. And so we're we're, we're not going to see larger projects. Uh, the annual income for TIF three going forward is going to be somewhere between three hundred fifty and four hundred thousand, rather than six and a half million and seven point two million, which is about where, uh, where it was before TIF 3 grew through it and took away a little bit of that increment, not a lot. So th with that in mind, uh, the AIP program is probably going to be the most active piece of that new TIF, and, it, and it's uh, in an area that is roughly from the lagoon, the west, or the northern east lagoon, which is on Lincoln Highway, over to uh, Dodge Avenue, and then a couple blocks north and south of, of that uh, corridor. And this falls within the corridor. Mr. Bundy's came to us a couple of months ago, and uh, first of all, uh, wanted to let us know that he's uh, purchased uh, the uh, 
he's the owner of AccuLab, but he and his company have purchased the former Camelot Training Center on North 5th. Uh, some of you with a longer memory will recall that is where the Farm Bureau was before it moved up on Peace uh, uh, Road. So uh, it's been vacant or underutilized for a number of years now. Uh, he grinds lenses, it's uh, optical lenses. It's a, it's a good business, it's a clean business, it's something that uh, re uh, requires some, uh, some technical uh, training and experience and uh, so he's bringing some new life to DeKalb in general in that particular neighborhood and uh, we applaud that. He's making an extraordinary investment just to get the building up to speed, having nothing to do with moving his company into that. Uh, and in excess of, of 1.1 million is what we're, we're told. Uh, so he, he has applied for some grant support as is provided in the AIP program uh, for uh, some of the interior mechanical work. And as we look through the long list of things and the contractor prices and so forth that he was, was happy to share with us, uh, it looked like uh, his, his appeal on that side uh, to help with uh, some of the plumbing and, and so grinding lenses, he's going to have different kinds of layouts and, and water is something that's very important. So uh, we, we, that easily came up to 25,000 as, as a 50-50 share for just the plumbing itself. So there's mechanical work, there's painting, there's new doors, new windows, and new roof and all the rest of that. So that's what this is. Uh, it, uh, it's almost entirely covered by the current uh, uh, TIF 3 budget. Uh, you know, there's one other thing that's still hanging out there that hasn't been expended, so I'm not sure at this point whether we're going to be over the line or not, and if we are in December, we'll do a budget amendment, but uh, we, we heartily recommend this. We welcome this company to our town. They've relocated from another town in the county because they like the space and they like the community. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Larson? Yes. Seven nine? Thank you very much for the investment in the community. Awesome, and Chris, as I mentioned, you're more than welcome to, to leave at this point, no problem whatsoever. All right, moving on to resolution number two. Resolution 2021-091, authorizing an auditing services agreement with Sickage LLP for auditing services related to fiscal years 2021-2024. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Alderman Verbeck, seconded by Alderman Favor, city manager. Thank you, Mayor. As I say in the background, we, we went out right after the last audit was, was accepted. Uh, uh, we're at the end of uh, Sikic's uh, multi-year contract with us, and uh, we, although technical services such as this are usually not turned over every year, or even every third or fifth year, but we, it's been a while, so we thought we would test the market and see where we stood. We've had, uh, good things to say about Sikic and, and as I did in the background, but we felt it was, it was a, a worthwhile and, and ethical exercise, so we did. We got some response, there were four in particular that met the, the pre-qualifications, and uh, there were two of those four that, uh, from a price standpoint, uh, were competitive. Uh, the one uh, glitch, we had worked with uh, Lauterbach and, and Ammon uh, before Sikic, actually, and I don't know if any of you have that memory, but um, the, uh, the issue is that they, uh, Lauterbach and Amen, uh, or Amen, excuse me, uh, had uh, already uh, secured our, our police and fire pension business, and that precludes them from uh, completing the annual independent pension audit. And uh, so that cost was not in their numbers, which artificially deflates their their price compared to Sikich. As we looked closer and, and pulled that out and looked at it, uh, just from a price standpoint, uh, Sikich's uh, pricing then was, was uh, more attractive and uh, in all their, their increase over the, 
the four uh, fiscal years that they propose to uh, uh, work with us on in the future, if, if you were to award this, uh, was an annual 3.6% uh, price increase, which is within market trends right now for professional services such as this. So we are recommending that we stay with Sickage. We feel this is a worthwhile exercise, but we think the re as a result of the exercise, uh, we're comfortable with Sickage. Council, any questions? Alderman Perkins. You get, you get two. Um, ballpark, what is the cost of the independent pension audit, generally? Uh, it, it was, uh, Josh, do you remember exactly what it was? Maybe not. They didn't give an exact price, but it was, it was our impression through the interviews that if a firm was to do an independent pension audit, they're looking at quite a bit of the financials in the first place, and the cost was quite large. Okay. In other words, exceeding the difference in the between that's, that, the two. That's where I'm really yes. going with it. Correct. And I guess kind of tied into that, second, secondarily, how many different sets of auditors do we have? Because it, it sounds like we've got one group auditing the police and fire pension, we've got sickage and this group doing a piece, we, and it sounds uh, like there has to be some separation there to, yeah. Yeah. for some oversight responsibility. But I guess I'm just wondering how many different sets of auditors we have well, the, the, the general city audit is done by one firm, and Sickage does that. So there's the, the, the CAFR that you're familiar with, which is the, the heart of the audited uh, funds that uh, the city holds. Uh, and uh, they also audit our, our, uh, our TIF program. They audit the CDBG program separately. So we have a number of independent audits, and then there's a general audit. We inherited a system from a while ago where uh, apparently previous council, previous administrations had, had separated that. And, and the pension laws do require independent auditing, so uh, I, that's why you're looking at two different firms here. And uh, uh, it's the system we have, and uh, Lauterbach is still on, on contract for those. And I guess that, that really kind of goes to the overarching yeah. thought is what's, is there benefit for having a minimal number of auditors going there, through things yeah. because there is some degree of overlap like you're talking about with the pension audit. They're going through and looking at things already <clears throat> and yeah. we're paying someone else to do the same thing. And I understand the separation requirement, but. The pension funds have their own mm -hmm. uh, uh, sway too under state statute and so they can choose who they audit, get audited by, but the city uh, otherwise takes on the audit responsibility for our other funds. So two different companies here at work. Uh, okay. There are places where they have uh, a separate company do the CBG <coughs> audit, a separate company do the TIF audit and so forth. I think that gets confusing <coughs> for the council, for, would for the staff. It would add to the work and the cost to us, even though that isn't reflected in the annual fiscal accounting. But, um, it, it, this is, I think, a system we're, we're used to working with. It's okay. I wouldn't recommend that we hire any other independent auditors for the, the bulk of our auditing work. So essentially we have two auditors. That's then, right. right. We have sick at some of the other folks who are doing the pension. Right. Okay, very good. <clears throat> any other questions, Council? All right, hearing none, roll call. Perkins? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Burbick? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. <clears throat> resolution passes. All right, resolution number three, resolution 2021-092, authorizing the award of a contract to Elliott and Wood Incorporated in the amount of $194,220.95, sorry, $194,220.95 for construction of a new shared use path along Dresser Road with staff authority to approve change orders up to a combined project total not to exceed $218,000. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Alderwoman uh, Morris, seconded by Alderman Favor, City Manager. Uh, thank you. This, this is really good news to the neighborhood, I have to tell you, and to people who have children who walk uh, north Annie Glidden to try to get to the high school, and uh, once they get to the intersection at Annie Glidden and Dresser, then in the really bad uh, and snowy weather, uh, there's, there's really n no path until you get over to normal. Uh, that means they're walking on a road because it get, the, the snow wants to drift in the, in the shoulder areas on either side. 
So uh, really probably the, the, the spark for this was the Twombly Road uh, work uh, that's been going on this year and the planning for that going back a couple years. The question was we can get uh, students uh, heading east to the Annie Glidden Corridor safely there on either a path on the south side of Twombly or a sidewalk on the north side and then they get there and then it's got to be uh, uh, excuse the phrase, a jailbreak to get to the other side uh, across traffic that's going 35 or 50 miles an hour uh, and then when they get over there they can go on a sidewalk until they get the dresser and then it's it's the wild west again so uh, the, the city has been contemplating two projects for a while now thanks to Zach Gill Thanks to some money from the Department of Commerce, we're in a position right now to do uh, one leg of the ultimate plan for sidewalk access, and that is this. Uh, between now and unless it rains constantly from now until Christmas, I, we should be able to get the aggregate base down that can be rolled and, and compacted so that we could, with a brush, clean it off enough so people can walk safely off the street for the winter and then in the, in the spring get this paved up so it's a proper path. It's on the north side of, of Dresser that goes from Annie Glidden over to Normal. Uh, along the way, uh, we're going to be working on the stormwater uh, issues, uh, the stormwater runoff issues uh, to the east of the road that goes to our Station 3 and, and back up into the uh, Health Services Center that the county has and, and fixing that uh, mostly along the way it helps on the north side and the shoulder area there so this is a a pretty good project uh, the bids came in much more aggressive than we thought there's a little bit more of a contingency than normal just because on the north side as i said we've got lots of terrain uh, uneven terrain to, to cross and the quality of the soils is still a little bit iffy questions council alderman burbick and for the length of the bike path currently, that was a partnership effort amongst multiple governing bodies yes. and uh, great work to everyone there. Uh, moving forward then, would we, would the city then be maintaining this piece along with snow yes. removal like you mentioned and yes. those kinds of things? Uh, we can, I, I would think we'd be able to have at least a conversation okay. with other partners. But uh, in the short run this year anyway, we'll make sure that it's, right. it's buffed up. Thank you. Alderman Perkins. You mentioned um, people crossing the street there. Now, and if memory serves there, there's a, a striped area for people yeah, to cross yeah. with a sign that says when, when pedestrians yeah. are present, yeah. they should be stopping. Yeah. Any idea how successful those things are? Uh, yes, uh, unsuccessful. I, I, I don't think Notoriously. they are. Yes. And, and I, I hate to ask a leading question, but I don't, I don't so, think they are. They are. Is there something we can do to yes, improve that? Yes, yes. Thank you. And I meant to touch on this as I was racing through the, the background. Uh, <clears throat> there's another piece, which I'm happy to say we'll, we have funded for next year, and that is to go up the west side of Annie Glidden from Twombly to the intersection with, with Dresser, where there is a signalized intersection, and there's the opportunity then to have those crosswalks really matter, because when, there, when it's uh, red and people can cross and so forth. Uh, that's that's not uneven terrain, but uh, it's grown over over a lot of years. There are a number of, of uh, and people never thought there'd be a sidewalk, so there are poles there and other things that have to be either relocated or we'll have to build the sidewalk around. But we have enough right of way to do it. We're going to do that next year. This is just a piece of that uh, pathway uh, program for that area. Good. Good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, roll call. McAdams? Yes. Herbig? Yes. Faber? Yes. Morris? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. Adai? Resolution passes. All right, agenda item four, resolution 2021. 0-93, authorizing the purchase of 12 CDS Genetech license plate readers in the amount of $145,865. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Alderman McAdams, seconded by Alderman Verbeck, City Manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, uh, I think a, a successful, certainly a well-attended uh, meeting was held 
at the New Hope Missionary Baptist Church back in early September to discuss uh, uh, what Chief Byrd led off by saying is the, uh, there is Chief, um, a, a relatively, in terms of numbers, relatively small. We're not talking about hundreds of thousands, we're talking about dozens of people who are uh, notoriously uh, kind of uh, bent on mischief, and uh, that's a nice way of putting it. People who are transient coming here uh, mostly to lay low or to lay out of sight and uh, while they're here maybe do a little business while they're at it. These are people who often come armed and uh, people who have some experience uh, walking on the wrong side of the law uh, are a real threat uh, to, to the, the peace and security of the community. Uh, uh, persons of very diverse backgrounds uh, spoke out at that meeting and there is a general consensus that something ought to be done but what could we do that doesn't put uh, law-abiding people at some risk or inconvenience? Uh, and uh, the, the one thought that we had proposed that night, and there's been more discussion about since, is something called uh, a license plate camera. This is not the camera that scans the whole car and uh, could potentially be used for profiling, which nobody wants to do, of, of law-abiding citizens, but looks at the license plate only, and why is that important? Because oftentimes the people who fall into that category, and I hate to categorize, but I think it's probably a fair categorization, um, who are coming here uh, uh, pretty much escaping the law, are looking, uh, oftentimes they've, they've got vehicles that are hot cars, or we already know uh, there's warrants for them, and, and we know the later last scene in a white something that was uh, heading westbound and with a license plate of X, Y, and Z. The readers have been very successful in other communities, some smaller than ours and some larger. Uh, and what they do is they basically ping our, our dispatch center and they say, this, this, this uh, license of this wanted car and this wanted person is in your community. And it gives us an opportunity to locate and pretty quickly find the people, hopefully that's how that would work. Uh, right now, uh, if something like, if a person of, of that description came into town tonight, there'd be no way to know that they were here. Just drive in at 2 a.m. and be here for two or three days and, and, and then start doing their work, which is not community work. It's not positive to, to our, our safety and security. So, uh, the, the police department was tasked with the responsibility of, of surveying the market for these types of, uh, of uh, cameras and equipment. Uh, the, the result of that survey is in your background tonight. Uh, the company that we found uh, was uh, not only from a price standpoint the most advantageous to us, but also in terms of having that kind of precise read uh, capability was uh, CDS, uh, Genetech is, uh, is the, the, the uh, description or the, the name, the, the uh, brand name. And uh, they are uh, also competitive. Uh, we, we asked them all for a lease arrangement for five years. Uh, their cameras, uh, uh, from the reference work we've done, seem to have a life of about seven to eight years, which would mean that after the, the lease period, they would become ours. and. Uh, now, there is a shelf life for any technology, of course, and maybe some of them won't go seven or eight years, but uh, we didn't have that option with the other uh, companies that we interviewed, and so this comes as a recommendation from the department, from the chief, uh, to proceed to purchase 12 of these. It's within the, the uh, reach of our budget, uh, and uh, we, I recommend uh, support for the police department's uh, proposal here. Questions, Council? Alderman McCannons. So um, I think it's a good idea. Um, I am curious as to how much reach a FOIA request or other information would be towards um, exposing that information beyond law enforcement. Uh, maybe John could help me on this, but so let's say the, the uh, I'm assuming, follow my logic here, John, if you would. So the question was, is this immediately foia -able? I think if if the camera reads, uh, let's say, the license of a, of a person who is fleeing uh, the laws on a warrant and, and so forth, and then there's uh, an arrest, uh, and uh, while that process is going on, uh, uh, the person would be charged, whatever, for whatever the crime was, it was the nature of the warrant, uh, the evidence that, that secures that charge 
uh, would not be foiable until the investigation is complete and there's been some adjudication of, of the crime. Am I correct? Correct. Yes, yes, you are. There are exceptions for uh, documentation <clears throat> that would be involved in a current investigation, a current law enforcement proceeding, something that would jeopardize a potential prosecution or all FOIA exceptions. So I, I think you're right. After that uh, leads to a conviction, uh, then at that point it potentially could become available. Okay, thank you. Alderwoman Larson? Where does the information come from? Because I was reading on some of the background information on the one company, Flock, and it was the more company or the more cities that had it, the more data, like they, we all became almost one police department with immediate information. Now with Genetech, is who puts that, that this is a hot car? Is it just from the state or? No, so um, ma'am, it's, um, just so you know, I mean, a lot of these, these systems, they are in sync. So okay. uh, just because we don't have, just because we wouldn't have vigilant cameras wouldn't mean that we wouldn't have vigilant information or access. So okay. meaning that, so I'll give you example, state police has vigilant, they, they use vigilant uh, system. They're going to put in a felonious vehicle, which means that it's wanted in a felony or it's, you know, and they'll put in a license plate and color and it'll mirror up with our system at some point. Once they come into our net over the city, um, we'll be able to capture uh, that information. And like the uh, city manager said, will be routed to our communication system, which then will be routed out to the field and then our officers will respond. So a lot of these systems, although they're different, they're very uh, close as far as technology. So, um, and uh, I, I wanna give, if I can real quick, I wanna give kudos to C Commander uh, Woodruff. He did all the heavy lifting with this. Uh, we did a lot of demos with all three companies um, as far as the, the, the technical aspect of it. Um, he has a strong, uh, you know, knowledge uh, in regard to the three systems that were in play. So we, we did have a lot of conversations uh, at the PD about the three systems. The, the biggest thing for us, uh, just so the council will know, that this is a force multiplier for us. It doesn't take the place of law enforcement. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, if we did not have the uh, license, plates, license plates readers, which we don't have right now, um, it doesn't take the place of good old fashioned police work. Uh, police officers still going to who have to respond uh, quickly and still make apprehensions, of course. We still have to locate these vehicles, uh, although they come in, in through a certain uh, choke point, uh, our officers are still going to have to locate them uh, in, in, a, in a swift and timely manner. Uh, so uh, if you can imagine within the city uh, parameters, uh, it'll be a little bit tighter net. Uh, I know that on, uh, I just talked to the Illinois State Police uh, probably uh, about a week ago, they have had vehicles that have come through their reader, but you're talking about a lot of escape routes. So even though those cars have hit a reader, let's say on an interstate at one location, you know, trying to locate them could be a little bit more difficult on an interstate, four lanes of traffic, access, exits constantly. Um, here in the city of DeKalb, you're talking about a little bit of a choke, a smaller choke point, uh, out, you know, and then we'll have our, our readers, you know, positioned in place in areas where we can, you know, tighten our perimeter and we should be able uh, to make swift arrests and stop these vehicles before they get out of our uh, threshold. So um, just a couple of things I, I just wanted, you know, uh, I did get some emails from some uh, residents who were worried about exactly what uh, city manager Nicholas spoke about, random uh, you know, tracking of their vehicles. That is not what this is for. This, this uh, resource is for, for us to ca uh, combat criminal activity within the city of DeKalb. So this, this is not about my license plate is suspended, my license plate is expired. That is not what this will be used for. We are only using these, uh, this resource for felonious vehicles. They come into the city of DeKalb, and at that point, that's when the uh, whole process will be triggered. So I just felt like that I need to get that out for uh, the several emails I did uh, receive today 
regarding uh, using it outside of the scope that it's intended. And uh, Wood, uh, Commander, you want to you want to add to anything that we said, or or are we on point? Okay, Alderman Perkins. So, so as a follow up to that, though, I, I am supportive of the of the thought of giving you guys more tools to to police with. Um, so, the, behind the cost there, though, there there has to be some element where we're where we're doing something to feed some database somewhere. And we're, when we're making some decision on what, what's going to be driving that database, is what is the driver behind that? Is it felony convictions that we're looking for? You know, how, who is, who's making the determination of what's going to be cute, what's going to be a pingable? Thing? So, you, yeah, so that, that's what I guess was my <clears throat> original point about us not looking for, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, minor traffic offenses. That's not what it's about. We're, so I'll give you an example of if we have a shooting and we know of a license plate in the description of the vehicle, that will be entered into the system. It's a felonious vehicle. So a felonious who, who vehicle. Who makes that distinction, though? Who makes that distinction of oh, what's going to be? Well, yeah, we would make that at the department. Okay. And that, you know, uh, there's certain, um, I mean, if you can imagine, felonious vehicles, think about amber alerts, silver alerts, uh, those type of, uh, you know, leads entries or NCIC entries that we normally would put into the system. Uh, those are the things that can be tracked and that we would want to put in the system because, you know, think of an Amber Alert. You have a child missing, so now it crosses into Aurora. They ping our car, they're on our vehicle, and then we, we have that child, uh, you know, recovered in a timely manner. So we would make that decision, sir, and it would, but like I said, there would have to be some criminal element for, on our end uh, or some investigative uh, need to put it into the system. So, like I said, nothing uh, in regard to uh, this minor traffic or any other minor violations. We're talking about felonious vehicles, criminal acts that occur in the city of DeKalb would be uh, entered into the system. But that, but I know uh, that's exactly the questions I received earlier was, you know, can I be tracked going to the store I mean, that, that's exactly what I, was, I received if I'm getting a, a, a gallon of milk. So that was, that was actually written to me today. And uh, of course, you know, the answer to that is uh, no, that wouldn't meet our threshold, of course. Um, but like I said, we're talking about felonious vehicles, amber alerts, silver alerts, stuff uh, on along that, those lines. So following up then, so do, do all three of these use, utilize the same database then? Because or is there, does each one have their own? Well, they have their own system. Their so, own system. I mean, but they can mirror. And I, that's what I mean. They can sync up. Right, uh, right. You know, okay. so we can talk to another department and share. So we can share with Aurora. Aurora can share with us. Same thing with Illinois State Police. Uh, they can do that as well. So when they enter into the system, they allow the Cal Police Department to read with the information that they put into the system. So otherwise, it does them, I mean, it really does them no good uh, to not allow us access because right. the car is in motion, it is, you know, it's on the move. So how do you, how do we help you and vice versa? And that's really what it's all about. It's really about helping each other as a unified front within the, the law enforcement ranks because as we can tell, we have a lot of transient movement. Uh, you know, we have criminals from Aurora here in DeKalb committing crimes and vice versa. So that's the best way that we can help each other is with this system. And this is the future of, you know, in, in law enforcement. Most cities at some point will go to this um, or, or at least some aspect of it. You know, how big of a footprint they have, um, I mean, that will be de determined by each individual city, but it, it is going to be the future, uh, one of the future resources in law enforcement that are used. I just have real concerns over determining who's going to make the decision over which vehicles we're going to be keeping an eye on. I mean, it, it really is a tool to keep an eye on things, and I don't really hear a lot of definition on saying, well, it's going to be 
things that we're, where we're pursuing a, a potent, a, someone that we think that's a suspect. You know, yeah. and that's, that's, that's the piece I'm wrestling But there with. is, is, is it, there is always it, has to be felons. I'm sorry, it, sorry, I mean to cut you off. You know, there always has to be some discretion on the law enforcement side. We decide what pursuits we engage. You, you know, I mean, we always have had that discretion. I think we have to have that discretion in order for us to, you know, to be prudent and do our, and do our job. So meaning that, uh, you know, if the subject's wanted for homicide, yes, we're going to let our officers engage in that pursuit. If, he's wanted, if the car is wanted for a stolen vehicle, we use our discretion. We say you will not be involved in that pursuit. So I think we, and when I say we, law enforcement, we have to have the autonomy to be able to control what goes into the system because we know, uh, I mean, we're dealing with the crime as it occurred, so we know what's relevant and we can't lock ourselves into a box because, the, you know, the crimes are just, I mean, I mean it's just too, it's too many variables for us to lock ourselves into and pigeon, pigeonhole ourselves into a, a framework. And I know where you're going. You want it to be A, B, C, D. And, and, and I, don't, I don't think that's possible because it's, it's, it's just, there's too many moving pieces. And, and I gave you an example about pursuits. We do it all the time where a supervisor makes that decision whether we pursue or not. So if you can imagine if there is a violent crime that the detectives who, are, who, who come out and handle that scene are going to be the ones to tell the commander, sir, I think we should enter this into the system based on A, B, C, D. And, and that's why I was really looking at for what's, what or who is making that determination on what's going into the database that we're going to pursue. Because to me, you could, depending on what it is, it's, a, it's, it's data that we're sending around. You know? So it could just be saying, all right, check the flag that we want to know about any felons that are coming into DeKalb. And I don't know how ethical that is. Just because you've, you've committed a felony but doesn't that, mean it, we want it, to know of every felon. Yeah, it, but you wouldn't be, we, wouldn't get <clears throat> a, we wouldn't get a hit off of, of a checkbox like that. We would get a hit off the plate that was already entered as a felonious vehicle. You, you see what I'm saying? We're not, we can't check a box and it'll just give us. So it's a suspect. It's a su we're looking for a specific. It's, it's a dynamic suspect. It's all, thing. It's all linked to the, license, the registration. Uh, and sometimes uh, partial registration doesn't have to be complete. So meaning that we could have the first two characters and the, and the vehicle be a, a white um, sedan with IT as the first plate. So we could be able to, we can enter that filter and then it'll give us all the vehicles in the area that are white sedans with IT as the first character. But we're starting from that point because that's the information that was received from either a witness, a victim. So that's how we, so it's not random uh, checking boxes that we get filtered all this information. Something has to be, a, has to predicate it, meaning a witness statement, victim statement, an officer statement, a report that was made, and then once it's entered into the system, that's how we're notified. And it's just like, uh, a stolen vehicle. Once we put your plate in, uh, Alderman Perkins, we're gonna, anyone who runs your plate is gonna get that hit. But we wouldn't have got it if we didn't talk to you and you tell us, hey, they stole my car, here's my plate. So, so it's something so, that's more dynamic in nature yeah. of sus suspects than historical in nature where we're yes. flagging things. You know yeah, what I'm we're, saying? Yeah, we're, we're getting the hit off of the information that's put in. And, it's, and like I said, this is all based off vehicle description, registration uh you know and that's the key if if this if this information is never put in the system they'll drive right through the lpr and will not be tagged okay. because we want you know there's no there's no there's no predication to to actually alert dispatch but once if that place put in and same thing with us we have a homicide in DeKalb. here's the plate here's the vehicle we put it in the system all of a sudden chicago police gets a hit about the, the cow felonious vehicle that was involved in a homicide, and then they take action from there. City Manager? Um, yeah, just two, two quick points, and as the Chief was saying, uh, uh, generally speaking, not exclusively, and what we're looking for are persons in flight from something, mm -hmm. hence on the car, right? Otherwise it would be, I don't know, it would be a bicycle reader, or, you know, a pedestrian reader or whatever, but uh, obviously in flight either from something or they're 
they're moving, possibly moving towards something that maybe a, in a string of, of uh, felonious actions. But uh, the one thing I might say here is that ultimately uh, this is a tool that people will be uh, trained on, dispatchers, we've been talking about them, and others, how, how to uh, invoke the use of this, the commanders and so forth. And that means it's going to go into our standing operating procedures. It's going to find their way in there. Uh, in the late 80s, you would not have seen the word cell phone or pager in any of our standard operating procedures. Now we've got cell phones, we've got other types of technology. This is another step, and probably the use of this and, uh, and the, invo the invoking of the use of this is at least generally at some point fairly soon going to be in there. And uh, ultimately we're coming to an item at the end of the agenda tonight, the Citizen Review Board. So if our department doesn't, doesn't enforce uh, discretion on these things and and our commanders don't, and the chief doesn't, and the city manager doesn't, and the council doesn't, then there's, there's one other fail safe. And so uh, just, I, I'm certain that this will at some point enter into those SOPs. Alderman Burbick. First of all, Mayor, uh, city manager, chief, uh, thanks for going out and talking with the community about uh, what options could be and engaging our community with what, what can be done here. Um, and I also received the same calls uh, that, that you did about, well, we're really not too sure about this, and this is how I explained it. So again, uh, innocent until proven guilty, I'm going to read the, these, and Chief, you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but largely the public isn't aware of what's happening, uh, the reality of what's happening, and why we've heard from past police chiefs that Council, we can't police our way out of this. And we've heard that a couple times now. So again, these are uh, those tools. Two weeks ago tonight, September 27th, felony aggravated battery to a peace officer, seven counts of felony criminal damage to property in Ward 6 in our ward. The next day, felony aggravated discharge of a firearm, four counts, and illegal possession of a weapon by a felon. Two days later, 10-1, felony aggravated domestic battery strangulation, also wanted on a warrant. October 2nd, felony aggravated unlawful use of a weapon, two counts. October 4th, felony aggravated battery use of a deadly weapon, same day, another offender, felony aggravated unlawful use of a weapon from a vehicle. A couple days later, on October 6th, felony manufacture and delivery of a controlled substance. On the 8th, felony escape from a monitoring of a violent domestic offender and two warrants, one a felony warrant. Same day, another felony arson and felony burglary. Next day, felony false complaint to 911. On October 10th, felony armed robbery and felony home invasion with a dangerous weapon. All along those two weeks, there were also 35 warrants that I could count filed on active criminals being sought. So I did the comparables after people contacted me to look at other communities and see what they're doing. So Urbana, Quincy, Elmhurst, Lombard, Park Ridge. I'm looking at their police reports and I can't find apples and apples. I'm not, I'm going back many, many months in these communities to find felonies. So chief, city manager, mayor, please let us know what we can do. Please let us know what tools we can uh, help out with as this, I believe, is unsustainable. Thank you. Thank Alderman, you. or sorry, Alderman Morris, no? Any other comments or questions? Well, I personally am excited about this, Chief. I think it's going to be a real asset for you and your department. Like you said, it's a force multiplier, but I also love it's proactive rather than being reactive when these uh, types of individuals are in a community and we're not getting them until after an event occurs. This is a way we can keep our residents safe by hopefully apprehending them before they do business in our community. Okay, so, yes, sir. I'm, I'm very excited about this. All right, roll call. Burbick? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? 
Yes. Perkins? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. 8 Resolution passes. All right, item number five, resolution 2021-094, approving a bar liquor license for Tangled Roots Beverage Company, LLC, DBA, Keg and Colonel, 106 East Lincoln Highway. Can I have a motion? So, so move. Second. I'm moved by Alderman Favor, seconded by Alderman Verbeck, city manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Some background reports. Uh, the company is moving uh, toward opening in December. Uh, although the liquor production the, or brewery portion of the business is probably not going to open until sometime later in, the, in 2022. I'm not sure exactly when that will be. we are involved a little more remodeling. Uh, this comes to you, uh, as, as these uh, things do, uh, for the approval of a license. So uh, in this case, uh, the uh, company's uh, already paid uh, in, in non-refundable fees for the liquor license application, the life safety uh, uh, inspection uh, for a number of background investigations, so on and so forth, and uh, they they are required to, to pay the full eleven thousand eight hundred ninety-seven dollars initial fees. They're not looking for relief from that, but what they are looking for because uh, they're not going to have enjoyed any part of that license, and they'll have to come up then for more fees right after the first of the year is a waiver uh, for a portion of uh, those, which would be the renewal fee which comes to about $3,823. We thought that was a fair, we, we've done it with any, but uh, since this is a new business, it made some particular sense. So we're recommending the approval of the license uh, with that waiver that's just, uh, described in the background. Council? Alderman I Favor? Say, I just say kudos to you and the staff for, for recommending that. I think it's, again, showing that DeKalb wants to be business friendly and. We want to take care of the businesses within our, within our city. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I'm just excited to see them opening up soon. I get that question a lot. When is Keg and Colonel opening? All right. Hearing no other questions, roll call, please. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. Adai? Resolution passes. All right, agenda item K, ordinances, second reading. Number one, ordinance 2021-040, amending the municipal code by adding a new chapter 46 citizens police review board. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Alderman McAdams, seconded by Alderman Favor. City Manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for bringing this back on the table. We're, I'm going to ask that you defer action on this at least one more time. Uh, the uh, background reports that uh, the what's actually been happening here. We're, we're still involved in collective bargaining. We have a, another session this Friday, and so we can proceed uh, with good faith. We, we'd like not to uh, take final action on this uh, until after uh, we know what the uh, outcome of that bargaining is. We're, we're pretty confident we're down to some wordsmithing now, and we're pretty confident we're gonna get there, and we'll bring back uh, the uh, red line version of what we've been working on for the last couple weeks. Council, any questions? Alderman Burbick. Uh, motion to postpone ordinance 2021-040. Second. All right, we have a motion to postpone it and a second. How does that work? Uh, John, uh, we have a motion to bring this forward and a second, and now there's been a motion to postpone it. Yeah, that motion would take precedence over the motion to actually vote on the item. So uh, the way the progression works, uh, generally the, the less you do, the more that motion has priority over prior. So for example, a motion to adjourn has priority over everything else. A motion to table something has priority over acting on the motion itself. Okay, awesome. So we had a motion by Alderman Burbick to postpone and a second by Alderman Favor. Any comments? Hearing none, roll call please. Morris? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. Adai? All right, the po postponement of ordinance 2021-041 passes. Moving on to ordinance 2021-042, uh, amending chapter 23, unified development ordinance, article three, definitions, and article five, zoning district regulations pertaining to automobile detailing, car washes, and service facilities. Can I have a motion? So moved. We skip Did I? <laughs> oh my gosh! You should have called. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll say word map. Just oh, the word word map. map. Yeah. Oh my gosh! All right, so we'll just back. I was. Sorry. 
almost at a perfect, uh, perfect reading. Dang it. All right. So we're going to back it up a little bit. We're going to go to agenda item L, ordinances first reading, ordinance 2021-041, approving the official board map of the city of DeKalb following the 2020 federal census. Is that correct? Yes. I'll take a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Alderman Smith, seconded by Alderman Verbeck. City manager, discussion. Thank you, Mayor. The council discussed the impact of the recent uh, federal census on our board map back on September 13th and I brought this back to you for action. Uh, the map that was presented to you on the 13th uh, is the map that's in the background to tonight's meeting. And uh, we, as you can see, I, re I replicated the, the charts that we'd used a month ago and uh, the, the story is still the same. We had to make some adjustments, not major adjustments, and in that the, the council consensus was to proceed the last time I brought it back. I think it's time to get that that ward map nailed down, so uh, I hope that you will approve this on both readings tonight if you are so inclined. Council? No comments, questions? All right, roll call, please. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. Adai? The ordinance passes. So I would take a motion at this point to pass ordinance 2021-041 on second reading. So moved. Second. Moved by Alderman, Alderwoman Morris and seconded by Alderman Favor. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Larson? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. Adai? Ordinance passes. Now moving on to the long-awaited ordinance <laughs> 2021 042 amending Chapter 23, Unified Development Ordinance, Article 3, Definitions, and Article 5, Zoning District Regulations, pertaining to automobile detailing, car washes, and service facilities. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Alderwoman Morris, seconded by Alderman Favor. City Manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, as Alderman Favor mentioned a little earlier, uh, uh, we, we look for ways to try to be more business friendly and less bureaucratic. And this is one another example of that. Um, I thank Dan Olson, our, our planning director, for seeing the wisdom and uh, make some adjustments in our Unified Development Ordinance, which has basically the, the guidelines for a variety of uses, hundreds of uses. It, it happened. Uh, as much as we'd like a car wash here and don't have one, uh, but car wash is, is uh, mentioned as a, a use in our UDO. But uh, uh, detailing, auto detailing was not. It's really not, uh, sometimes you get a car wash and sometimes you don't, but uh, uh, a, a local business uh, had, had a problem relocating here uh, uh, because we, we couldn't find a place for it in our code. So. Uh, this matter has been to the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, to review a number of areas where auto de detailing might be allowed in the, the light commercial, general commercial, light industrial zoning districts, uh, and a special use in the central business district. Uh, we are not uh, aware of interest in, in the, the central business district, but might happen at some point. Uh, and uh, the, the commission thought uh, with a vote of six to zero, this was a good idea. We recommend your support. Council? Hearing no comments or questions, roll call please. Perkins? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. Adai? Ordinance passes. Would you like us to try and pass it? Okay. Please. I take a motion to pass this on second reading. Motion. So Moved by Alderman Perkins, seconded by Alderman Verbeck. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. McAdams? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Faber? Yes. Morris? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. Adai? Ordinance 2021-042 passes on second reading. Thank you. All right, moving to agenda item M, reports and communication. Councilman reports. Uh, you want to kick us off, Alderman Morris? 
Sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to highlight all the progress that we worked through here tonight, uh, you know, in the first ward specifically. It's just thrilling to see, you know, sidewalks coming to fruition and long awaited roads uh, like Twombly being worked on, um, you know, the Citizen Review Board innovative policing techniques, all of this coming together, and I think it's a lot of progress that we need to make sure that we are uh, recognizing and appreciating um, that our city's working toward for us. Um, not to mention the innovative energy techniques. So thank you, you all are working very hard, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Alderwoman Larson. I just want to remind everybody that we are in the middle of farm country and we are smack dab in the middle of harvest, not tonight with the rain, but the rest of the time. And those tractors are big and they take up a lot of the lane space. And if you're on a two lane road, they don't back up very well. So mm -hmm. just keep your eyes open for our farmers out there. Alderman Smith. Uh, special thanks to AccuLab for coming into you know, downtown, or in, that's called downtown DeKalb. Mm -hmm. Those buildings have been sitting idle for, as the city manager said, for a long, long time. So I've been keeping an eye on the, the construction guys over there. I know them, so they've got their hands full, but it looks like you're making very good progress. Again, thank you, sir. Agreed. Alderman Perkins. No report. Alderman McAdams. No report. Alderman uh, Burbick. No report. Alderman Favor. So I did, I did want to say, I saw a couple uh, people out picking up trash in the knolls um, after you know it was like Thursday there was a bunch of trash Saturday morning they were out there I think again that is one of the easiest things that you can do um, to show respect for your community as well as we were talking before the meeting that that's also a, a way that uh, you know it it means so much to other people they start to think about their you know should they if they were to throw out trash and then it also encourages other people hey i can do that too and then with the fall here great time to uh, trim up your trees so if your trees lean over the sidewalk mm -hmm. those that like to uh, go out for a walk or whatever now is a great time to start trimming some of those up so that's all um, I usually have a lot to report. This time I don't necessarily because as Alderwoman Morris uh, made the comment, there, there was a lot in here. And in the last couple of weeks, I have to thank uh, City Manager Nicholas, I have to thank Chief Bird. Uh, they've given a lot of time to me and many other. Just bashing a lot of this out, having the conversations and figuring out how to move things forward. So I uh, wanted to say thank you. And uh, I agree with everything everyone said. From Chris, what you're doing over there with AccuLab is absolutely fantastic, too. I agree 100%, Alderman Favor. Uh, just had more people bend over and pick that thing up. Uh, we can continue to beautify our city. All right, uh, city manager report. Uh, just one quick thing. Uh, not everybody, unfortunately, who's passed through the, the old subdivision in the last 48 hours has been uh, well-meaning. One of the entry signs was defaced. Uh, Alderman Verbeek pointed out to us this morning, uh, and I want to thank Andy Rye, uh, the sign was removed. Uh, we, uh, we're, we're cleaning it up. It's a little weathered anyway, so we're going to replace it uh, at no cost to the residents uh, of the Knowles, and then we'll have a spare uh, just in case. So uh, it does point up that uh, the happy thing is, so what uh, Alderman Favor said, that we have a lot of people who are out there trying to make this uh, a uh, cleaner, more beautiful city. Appreciate it. Excellent. All right. Moving on to agenda item N, executive session. Uh, approval to hold an executive session in order to discuss the purchase or lease of real property as provided for in 5 ILCS 120 slash 2 C5. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Alderman Favor, seconded by Alderman Smith. All right, we are adjourned to closed session. All of you in the audience, uh, we appreciate you coming out. Um, oh, oh, what I do? You need a roll call. Roll call. Roll call. Yes, sir. <laughs> Verbic? Yes. Favor? Yes. Morris? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. McAdams? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. Eight I. All right, we are now adjourned to closed session. So thank you all. Um, we have to ask you to excuse yourself at this point so we can move into closed session. <laughs>